live soon, folks. We'd like to welcome you to another Voters' Rights Task Force meeting. We are live streaming um, uh, some wonderful topics for you guys. Um, thank you for sharing on your pages. Um, let's get everyone enrolled in this idea of election integrity. We can run great candidates um, till the cows come home. But unless we can clean up our election process, um, we will not get people out to vote that do not um, trust the system. So thanks again for tuning in. And we will be getting started quite soon with Jim Soper uh, and Richard talking about um, the advantages, disadvantages of hand counted paper ballots and elections and what is the future for California. And this is the mic. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's square right now, like it was all set up and Let me see the conversation. Can I see it for a second what it really looks like to them? Just that's, that's what it looks here. like. Okay. Okay, good. It could even be. Actually, close with the I didn't carry that part. So, do we want to start again? Or? Yeah, I think it's 8 o'clock now, so you can start again. Do you want to hold it? Yeah. That's it all. And we'll pass it back to the staff. Sure. We have four viewers. Hi, folks. This is Lucy Riley with Ballots for Bernie and the California Election Integrity Task Force, meeting once again with the Voters' Rights Task Force. And we're going to be talking about some issues that are near and dear to all of our hearts. We are in the process of cleaning up our elections process here in the state of California. And to do that, we've got to educate ourselves so that we can mobilize large groups of folks to come out and support us both in um, our elections coming up in the fall we need poll workers, we need precinct monitors, we need precinct captor, captains, and we're gonna need a whole army of folks to help us ma um, monitor the ballot count after the election, just like we did after the June primary. So once again, we are here with Jim Soper. Give us a wave, and, and Richard, hey. Richard we're in, Yeah, Richard Tam, and we are in Richard's living room. It's homegrown and it's raw, folks, and we've got lots of great information for you tonight. We want to start off talking about hand-counted paper ballots. Jim, can you tell us what is the, um, is the uh, width and breadth of um, this discussion really about? And we want to talk about some advantages of hand-counted paper ballots as well. Hi, thank you, Lucy. Um, Hand-counted paper ballot as it carries an acronym of HCPB, and what it really means is hand-counted paper ballots counted in the precinct before the ballots leave the precinct. And this has the support of many, many people, many, many advocates, democracy advocates, uh, because they don't trust the machines. They want to have teams of people hand-counting the ballots when when they're still in the precincts before anybody's really had a chance to fiddle with them and that's an important part of, of what they're, they're proposing what they're in favor of uh, so H it's the same kind of paper ballots means in the precinct and again you will have one or more teams of about four people to a table with a couple, somebody writing it down, somebody reading off the, the votes, and two other people observing, that's one way to do it. 
and they will just proceed until they come out of balance that evening and then somehow let the county headquarters know what the votes were. Richard, did you have anything? No, no, that's it. No. Well, there would be a couple of teams of people from either, from each of the major parties, so they would be watching each other to make sure the counts are accurate. Double checking it. Yeah, you, you would, of course, want to have observers from multiple parties to do that. I will add then that this is done in numerous countries, uh, Germany, Ireland, Canada. Uh, they hand count the paper ballots before they leave the precinct. And Germany gets it done that night. Imagine that. Imagine that. Yes, but they don't have 20 propositions like you do in California. <laughs> And that's the difference. Yeah. Every time you somebody mentions a country where they hand count the ballots, there's one or two, maybe three items on the ballot to count. Right. This November in California, we're going to have 18 statewide propositions to vote on. 18. That's not counting any of the local propositions. That's not counting any of the offices that will run to 30 or 40 items on the ballot to count, which is a lot more than two or three. So that's, this becomes a big consideration. So I think that we've talked about a few advantages and disadvantages with just that one anecdotal um, uh, uh, experience alone. So Jim, can you talk to us more about the advantages um, of hand counted paper ballots here in California? What would that look like? What would that mean? What would it entail to get uh, what seems like um, uh, an insurmountable task done? Well, politically, the registrars don't want to do it um, because it's very hard to organize. They already have a tough job with trying to keep an army of poll workers to work just to show up for their job that day. If you were to do it, if you were to count them in the precincts, I think you have to bring in another team of people because the poll workers in California have worked from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's a 15-hour day. That's already too long. And then to ask them, they're tired, to count ballots, which is a tedious job, means you need to bring in separate team. Right. That's, that's one thing for starters. Secondly, is just to get people to show up. In Iowa in February, uh, the Democratic Party had, the, they had their caucuses. 85 precinct captains did not show up for their caucus. Wow. And there's a big problem in this country of getting people to, to show up when they say, gonna, say they're going to show up. So that, that becomes part of what the registrars have to organize is they have to have backup people ready to, to go in and do things. Uh, we would have to put in a second team. And really, we would probably have to reduce the number of, of items on the ballot drastically. I, I have been in favor of trying this out in small side elections. Mm -hmm. In California, have the registrars experiment with, oh, they have a special election for school board or something. Do it there mm -hmm. and see how it works. And then scale up to see how it works elsewhere. Uh, but it, it would entail, a, a, first of all, bringing a separate team of people and cutting down the number of items on the ballot. Uh, one thing I've been toying with is we have jury duty where people randomly are selected to be on a jury. We could have something very similar, something called election duty, where you would be, uh, you would have to, um, you would be called in to work an election in the evening to count ballots. And it would be split up between at least the two major parties. Uh, so there would be a team from each party in each precinct. But something like election duty would be uh, very easy, I think, to, uh, to arrange and set up. And it would be like from the time you let, uh, the polls close, 8 p.m., uh, it would be a matter of maybe three or four hours, probably, and they could probably get it all done with a fresh team starting at 8 p.m. 
Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's, it's apparent that what we do need in the state of California is a committed army of people who um, hold election integrity um, and our democracy close to their hearts. Um, we need you to step up and to um, reach out to your friends um, to become poll workers for the fall election and for this to be um, something that you are committed to um, every election. Um, we need poll workers who are not only committed to showing up, but are, are committed to growing with the process so that five elections from now you're a pro and that you're training other pros. So we've talked about some advantages to hand counted paper ballots in the election. Um, let's talk about some disadvantages, Jim. I'm sure there are plenty. From the registrar's point of view, and they're the people that have to make the, the elections function. It's more people than anything else, getting the people there. I'll give you a tiny example of, I talked with somebody who had been participated in the ballot counting process in Cologne, Germany, two years ago. And they were just counting the vote by mail ballots for a city of about 800,000 people. To, and they don't, they don't have extensive vote by mail. In order to do that, they had to have an exposition hall with 10,500 people. That's an army. <laughs> that's an army, and that's just the vote by mail ballots. When you scale up to Los Angeles County with 4,500 precincts, and then figure out how many people you're going to have in each piece if you're getting up towards 100,000 or more that they have to organize. Secondly, counting ballots is tedious. Initially, you pay attention, but I've seen this myself, it just gets boring. And if you do it for several hours, it gets boring. And people make mistakes. Now, I, one part, one, one example that was very impressive was Tunisia in 20, uh, 2010, held their very first election, and I was a consultant to the precinct captain for the polling place in San Francisco. They showed every ballot to everybody in the room, mm -hmm. one after another, so that everybody saw it. It wasn't just a couple people counting and maybe a couple in service. Everybody saw it. So there was no question. Except Habib, who told me, who organized it, he said, you know, afterwards, it was the people, big, there were mistakes that people didn't catch. Mm -hmm. It was the people standing behind watching the, the stack of ballots that was going to be counted. They caught a couple mistakes. Mm -hmm. But having all those eyes meant that the count was likely to be more accurate. Just having four people, um, it gets tedious, and you're gonna have to give them lots of coffee. Do you have anything? Mm -hmm. uh, the one other thing uh, I'd like to mention is uh, management is a nightmare with the number of people involved, but the amount of money it costs a registrar to buy electronic voting machines, and tabulators, uh, and have them maintained year after year, have them reprogrammed for the next elections. You would actually save money if you pay people election, uh, election duty costs and, and had them required to come in and work an election the way they would uh, do jury duty. You would probably save a ton of money and you would, you would pump the money into the local economy because you'd be paying people who live in the area, that would, that would stimulate the economy in the area, and it would definitely be cheaper than the electronic voting machine systems. So folks, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we've got a couple of questions and a couple of comments on the live feed. Um, so we hear from um, Sheila Machini um, that you're very right, Richard. Getting people to show up is difficult. Having election duty, like jury duty, to hand count ballots is an intriguing idea to help mitigate that problem. Um, she wants to know if there are any more particulars about this process um, that you have um, looked into. 
um, any more information that you might be able to share on this at this time? Uh, absolutely no. Okay, all right. It was just a, but it's a, a great idea, and idea. we'll you know definitely be uh, uh, hunting that down in the future. It I seems like, like it, it's a possibility for for trying to get a bill. It's a possibility of trying to get a bill passed to do a pilot in some smaller county in some off election using a system like that. Yeah. So folks, keep the uh, questions coming. Um, we'll be glad to entertain all of those questions as we're going along. Um, so we've talked about the advantages and disadvantages to hand-counted paper ballots in the state of California. Um, so we also want to talk about um, what does the future look like for our elections in California? Well, with respect to counting ballots in the precincts, it's not too good. There's a bill that is about to be approved in uh, the Assembly now, SB 450. It will be approved by the legislature. This has been backed by the leadership of the Democratic Party and the Secretary of State and the chair of the Senate Elections Committee. Uh, it's going to allow counties starting 2018, 14 counties, to switch to a vote center model. If there's two, two parts to this, and they have to do both or they do none. One is that they will send out vote by mail ballots to everybody, whether they ask for them or not. If they do that, then they set up vote centers. A vote center, good news, would be open for 10 days before the election, starting on the Saturday. <clears throat> so you get lots of early voting, and you will be able to go into a, any vote center, and there would be about one-tenth the number of vote centers as there are precincts until the last weekend when it's about one-fifth. Uh, you will be able to go into any vote center in your county and say, I want to vote. And so they will be taking ballots. They will print out the ballots there and, and give it to you. The ballot that's appropriate for your precinct. And let you vote. And then you put it in there in the ballot box. So they're going to have, in, again, in LA County, ballots from 4,500 precincts, theoretically, in any one vote center. You cannot sit there that evening and divide up several thousand ballots into four and a half thousand stacks before you start counting them. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated. So the idea of counting ballots in the precinct on election night is simply going to disappear. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes a moot point here. I would like to see a uh, California experiment with it like to do it in these off elections and, and see what happens, but the dread is going to vote by mail, which means you're not voting in precincts, half of California's vote by mail already, mm -hmm. and it's just going to get more, bigger, bigger number, and then we're going to go to vote centers starting in 2018, and there will be no real precinct polling places left, so counting them in the precinct is a moot point. Okay. Jim Richard, thank you so much for um, that great history and these wonderful ideas moving forward. Um, we welcome, again, all of your questions. Um, we welcome all of your questions. It looks like we have a question from Kyle DeFranco. Is there a template ballot and list of arguments we can take to our local officials? I'm trying to um, get this going in Pennsylvania. Thanks. Pennsylvania for tuning in. And I think officials need some exact instructions on how to implement this. Jim, would you like to take a shot at that? There is a center for hand counted paper ballots run by Sheila Parks. If you just go and Google hand counted paper ballots, you will find a number of election integrity organizations that have or, or backing this and they've done some studies and experiments where this, this was done. I think about 10 years ago in New Hampshire in some of the precincts where they hand counted them. And so there are reports out there about uh, how to conduct it. I can't point you to any specific one other than to start with the Center for Hand Counted Paper Ballots. 
Well, folks, thanks so much. We've got some great questions pouring in. Not necessarily dealing with hand-counted paper ballots, <laughs> but um, interesting nonetheless. Um, so um, this is a great question coming in from um, Mario Amoratara. Um, and his question is, automatic voter registration of citizens as soon as they turn 18 would be a great idea. How about let's have an opt-out system instead of the opt-in system like we have now? Jim, would you like to address that? I'm not fully up to verbs of what's going on. I think you, when you go into the Department of Motor Vehicles, you can easily register there. A lot of countries automatically register you to vote, but they also give you a, a national ID card when you turn 18 or even before. So they already know about you. You're already in their databases. We don't have a national ID card in the United States. We should be yeah, registering students when they graduate from high school. But about, what about the ones who don't graduate from high school or outside of the system? I would like to see as many people register as possible, but there has to be some official system in which to get them, uh, they're already in the database, so you can automatically register them, and we don't have one single unified system to do that. Yeah. And we definitely need one. If we can, if Oregon can do it, we can do it, right? So um, let's see, we have another question um, from Richmond, California. Hi, Ellie Fadden. Thank you so much for tuning in. So Ellie has a great question about um, online voting, one of our favorite issues around here. Um, Ellie says, um, a voting algorithm on an open source platform would be one of the simplest programs to write. There is no excuse for not being able to vote online securely and accurately. Backed up by paper ballots, I think it would be a bulletproof system. All right, Jim, I'm going to let you go at your favorite subject. <laughs> you have a problem. You say backed up by paper ballots and you're voting on the internet. Internet voting means you're voting with no paper ballots. It's all electronics. And so, yeah, you can sit there and, and say, oh, well, this is my paper ballot. See, I have it at home. That's how I voted. There's no proof that that's how you vote it. You're going to try to take what's done uh, online. And the issue here, well, there's a couple of issues. One is we always want to have paper ballots because we need redundancy in the system. We need to be able, if something goes wrong, and it will, we need to be able to check it. And the best way to do that is with paper ballots. And internet voting, by definition, means you don't have paper ballots. You're relying on electronics. Now, if it was not already clear, and it was clear to us, some of us, well, many of us have probably been this 15 years ago, by the time we get to Putin hacking the DNC emails and the Department of Homeland Security coming along and saying this is a national security issue now, it's finally dawning on people that, no, you cannot protect anything. I mean anything on the internet, it's connected to the internet, or even if it's not connected to the internet. Strongest case in point, the United States conducted a new type of warfare. We initiated a new type of warfare. We took down Iranian centrifuges in Iran that were not connected to the internet. But the United States and probably Israel put together large teams of people that did a brilliant job of programming and brought down those centrifuges and did it in a way that the Iranians didn't even know was happening. So if something that's not even connected to the internet could be brought down, then nothing is safe. And if you put our elections on it, then it's going to be a big fat target for hacking from Mr. Putin to some Wall Street bank to somebody who's going to go after it, and they will get in. It's a frightening scenario. Yeah. Uh, there's an organization called Verified Voting. Uh, it's verifiedvoting.org. One of the um, people uh, 
involved in it is uh, Dr. David Jefferson. He wrote an article that goes is some titled something like "If I Can Shop and Bank Online, Why Can't I Vote Online?" It's one of the better articles explaining why it is totally unsafe to vote online. It goes into a lot of good detail. So uh, Google it. Referencing that, if I can bank, bank online, why I can't I vote online? There's a big difference between banking and voting. When you do banking, you get a transaction number. Every time you do something with a bank, there's a number attached to it, so you can track it. In voting, simply said, your vote is supposed to be secret. Mm -hmm. And so nobody can know how you voted, and you are, if you do it right, you can't prove to anybody how you voted. Because if you can prove it, then you can sell your vote. So all of that is excluded. There's no way to track using transaction numbers your ballot. And so that produces a huge problem for trying to make internet voting uh, retraceable, trackable, to, so we could recover when something goes wrong. Yeah. You just can't make a fail-safe system. No. Not yet. Not yet. So we've got a, not yet, right. So we've got a great question from Denise Hartle. Um, Denise, thanks for tuning in. Um, Denise asks, would there be a way to make software honest? This is a great, another great question. <laughs> Love these. Love these. Thanks, folks. Nothing that's foolproof, no. Nothing that's foolproof. If the biggest threat for election systems is from insiders, either the officials working uh, at the county headquarters who can get to the tabulator or the programmers to write the programs to run the systems. I got into this 10 years ago when somebody told me that one of the Debolt programmers for the Debolt systems has 23 convictions mm. for embezzlement mm. and he's programming our election systems. <laughs> And, and he, he did it so well, it was, uh, they couldn't even, didn't even find out about it immediately because he did it so well. Oh, yeah. yeah. He did it well, I and mean, it wasn't, Ben so Harris got him all of the code. He was a proven. Uh, I've seen the conviction papers. Yeah. He, this is real, and he was, he got hired by a guy he met in prison. Sean Dean, who he met in prison, and um, that guy had been convicted on, on cocaine charges. That was it. And they're working for the company that will become Debolt. Yeah. Is there a way we can make software honest? The systems are so complex. The operating system that your iPad or your phone runs on has literally got millions of lines of code. And people will come up with ingenious ways of hiding computer code inside of pictures or inside of an icon or inside of a, 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 a wave, a sound, sound mm -hmm. file. It's hidden in there, and you don't even think of looking for it. So there's so many ways for somebody to do things, to hack into it, and, and leave little, what we call Easter eggs, lying around, that uh, you cannot be sure that any system is, is foolproof. So you always have to have the paper, and you need to always audit it very well, which is something we don't do in California. So, Jill, I see a couple of questions about open source software as well. Yeah. Um, question coming in from Humboldt about open source so software. They're very proud of their open source software out there. Yes, they should should we speak to that? Open source software means that the software code is uh, available for anybody to look at. And so it's less likely to be raped. Less, it's more likely to be honest, or dis less likely to be dishonest. Uh, it, it is definitely an advantage to have open source software. They, in Humboldt County, Mitch Trachtenberg wrote a system that he uses to count, recount the ballot images. And Humboldt County does it right. It's, it's the, they will collect all the images of the ballots and run it through a system, and they'll, they'll count the ballots here with his program. What we are seeing now is a move away from the private voting systems, Diebold, Sequoia, Dominion, and so on, and into open source systems, or at least what's called disclosed systems. I won't go into nuance, but Los Angeles, 
County is building what is probably going to be a disclosed system. We've been at that since 2009, and it'll start to roll out in a couple of years. San Francisco just got the budget passed. Mm -hmm. For them to start planning for an open source system, we have Travis County, Texas actively involved. Uh, the University of Florida has a system, Prime 3, and there's several other uh, systems out there. If you go to my website, countedascast.org, and look at the top of the topic, public election systems, you will see a list of these systems that are coming down the pike and that deserve our support because they're going to be much better. But they will not, again, be perfect because there's too many, out of millions of lines of code, there's too many places where things could be fiddled with that nobody would be even looking for. I just wanted to clarify that uh, about Mitch Trachtenberg and Humboldt, uh, Humboldt County, that is a, uh, a way to verify that the vote was counted correctly. They still use regular electronic voting machines to count the votes, but this is a way of auditing that count to make sure the count is correct. So, we've got another question from Mario. Um, so, and this is, um, I'm assuming, in reference to the um, monitoring teams that we were talking about. Um, would these teams not be uh, need to be independent? Seems like having people from both parties opens up um, for possible fraud. Hmm. Having people from both parties or not having? Uh, his question is, is: Seems like people having people from both parties opens up for possible fraud. I don't quite get that. You want to have as many people watching as possible. But again, um, you have to be aware that, I, I, I've heard of proposals where they're gonna video the ballots. And I think that's a good idea. But I, I saw a message from somebody from Cook County, Chicago. He said, you know, and, and we, we try to get poll workers for our precincts in seven parts of Chicago, and we cannot get Republicans. We have, and, and the, the rules are you have to have Republicans working that that precinct, so they have to find somebody who's willing to switch parties, declare themselves a Republican so they can go in and represent that party. And I'm sure that there are parts of the country, I'm thinking of the Deep South, where it's the Republicans that control the, um, the counting of the votes and the running of the elections. And it can be very, you can get into precincts where there are no Democrats there available to, to watch. So it goes both ways, and you just get these highly concentrated areas where it's all one party and not the other, and then you have a crowd. Yeah. Okay, so lots of great questions, folks. Some of you have come back and clarified some of your questions from earlier. Thank you so much. We'll try to get back around to that. So um, Ida Martinak says question from the room thanks room <laughs> okay regarding vote by mail given what happened in the primary should we all register as vote by mail so as to avoid being given provisional ballots i.e give the rov a hard time if we do not receive um okay our ballot 10 days before voting um or obtain that vote by mail ballot and then surrender it at the polling station in order for our vote to count uh, the day of the election. Do you want to take that in segments or? I'll try to do the whole thing. Okay. Thank you for the question, Ida. Um, yeah, for this election, you should register and get a vote by mail ballot. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, the opportunity to vote at home. Be quiet and do your research on the internet to, to find out what's going on. So that's an advantage. You are also right in that, yes, you, sh it's, you know that there's a close election. If, if it's all already decided, then that, that's one thing. If you know there's a close election, you should take the ballot into the precinct. Don't put it in the mailbox, take it into the precinct and give it to them because they have to put it into a chain of custody system where they keep track of how many vote by mail ballots they got. And so they're starting already to track that ballot and put it under a more secure delivery back to the county than what the 
what, what the post office can do, because the post office isn't doing everything they should be doing yet to, to really track our ballots. So yeah, get your vote by mail ballot, and then hand it in at the precinct. When we move to vote centers, you will get a vote by mail ballot, whether you ask for it or not. This is in 2018, 2020. And in that case, take it into the vote center. Uh, use it, fill it out. I, I vote by mail, and I, what I enjoy is being able to calmly fill it out, and then either send it in or, or go in and hand it if it's a close election. You don't, you don't. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to ask, um, in the primary, so if you brought the vote by mail ballot into the polling station, it would go into this bin with vote by mail ballot and get yes. counted later. Yes. But if you surrendered it for a regular not vote by mail ballot, then it would count the same day. That's my understanding. Right. Is that Richard? Yeah, that's true. That's true. It would count the same day. If you if you surrender it and they uh, tear it, uh, leave it in the envelope, then you could get it just a regular ballot in the polling place and vote in the polling place and that will count that night. So you you must yeah. keep the, the envelope intact, everything. Yeah, you must yeah. bring it back with the return envelope. Yeah. yeah. That's the way it is now. Once uh, if once SB four fifty is it passes um, and they have vote centers and everyone gets a, a vote by mail, it'll be different. And I not clear on all the details about how it would be different. Uh, you, you, you could either vote by mail or vote in the vote center, and since everything is electronic and online, they could tell when you go to the vote center wh whether you already voted by mail, and then you wouldn't be allowed to vote in the vote center, or you could vote in the vote center, and then if they get a vote by mail for you later, I think your vote in the vote center would count, uh, and they w wouldn't charge you with fraud because you voted twice, I think. They're, they're still working out all the details, I think. In this primary, they really, we did not count. That was one thing that we totally didn't, didn't predict that would happen. All this, suddenly, all these people registered as vote by mail, allegedly who were not registered as vote by mail voters, so they, they had to be given provisional ballots at the polling station. So I'm kind of wondering how we can, we can um, that's, prevent that's that from the, happening. The problem with people showing up and being told, oh, you voted by mail already, um, that's appearing more. This is getting onto another problem that, again, we could foresee 10 years ago. The voter registration databases are being fiddled with. It came out in spades this June. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and we even had officials, not just advocates, but officials from Illinois, Arizona, and Riverside County saying, yeah, our voter registration databases are being hacked. Surprise, mm -hmm. surprise. <laughs> it's, it's, we saw that in California, people showing up, and they said, well, you already voted. And I said, no, I didn't. And so they were given the provisional ballot. And we had a lot of provisional ballots of people oh, yeah. showing up said, oh, well, you're registered XYZ party. Yeah. And the guy says, no, I've been voting Republican for 20 years. What do you mean? Yeah. And, well, it says here he registered XYZ party. Here's a provisional ballot again. What's not in the law SB 450, but what's happening is that had to be in place in order for this vote center idea to work out is that the vote centers will be connected to a statewide voter registration database so that they will be able to look up uh, if you voted or not, which registration is in, this part is in the law, you can change your registration on the spot. Ah, nice. That's wow. a major change. You can change your registration on the spot or even register on the spot. And that's coming down. That's a big plus, as long as the system doesn't get terribly <laughs> hacked. Right. Right. Uh, I'm yeah. sure there are going to be some problems with it that they're going to have to iron out. 
Thank you. So thanks for that question. Yeah, keep them coming, folks. Um, we've had a lot of people tune in. Thanks so much for tuning into our live stream. Um, do us a favor and do your fellow voters a favor. Share this live stream on your page, which will encourage other people to tune in. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll be doing these live streams once a week, um, going into our um, Election Integrity Conference that is going to be held in Richmond, California at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, and that is right across the street from the Civic Center in Richmond. We'll, it will be um, October 7th through 9th. Um, we encourage you to stay tuned, more details to come. Uh, tickets will be $25, which is a modest um, amount of money to help us cover our expenses. And we promise uh, um, volumes of great information to help you uh, be part of uh, cleaning up our elections uh, process here in the state of California. Um, so we are about 25 minutes into the live stream now. Yeah. So um, we've got a few more minutes, folks, for questions. Please get those questions um, uh, uh, into us so that we can um, address those. Um, one more question that came in um, was concerning the new Carter Center website that is going to um, be online soon, um, where um, citizens can check online to find out about um, how elections should be running in their area and report problems. Um, a lot of complaints about um, our election um, this primary have called for um, international monitors, UN monitors to come in. Um, that would be great. Um, we are not going to be holding our breath for that anytime soon, are we guys? Um, but this Carter Center initiative is a great start. Um, we uh, here um, at Ballots for Bernie know that um, in two weeks' time after the June 7th primary, we were able to organize 58 county teams um, on the ground as ballot count monitors. Um, and we know that if we can get that volume, um, if that army of people on the ground that quickly, um, we can um, mobilize an army of people to help us with uh, cleaning up our California elections. Um, so guys, what are your thoughts? Um, we've had uh, numerous questions come in about exit poll um, variances in other states. Um, and we know that if um, we have more than a 5% variation of exit polls with the actual um, numbers that came out of an election, um, we have gone to war over that, right? We have uh, sent uh, the UN in to uh, monitor elections and hold elections over um, for that same kind of problem that we're looking at right here in the good old land of the free. So, um, Jim, could you address that problem as um, it relates to California? Because in the state of California, uh, with um, millions and millions um, of voters, um, far more than any other state, um, we have particular problems here um, that are not present in other states. With as many vote by mail ballots as we have, exit polls in the state of California would perhaps not reflect um, the ballots that were cast um, prior to the election and would not be necessarily reflective of uh, the votes that were cast that day. I'm not quite the right person to ask about exit polls, I'll just say it's, it's not my area of expertise. I've seen people write things up that probably got the mathematics right, but I did take some courses in statistics, and it wasn't just getting the math right, it's applying it properly, and I've seen people doing exit polls and then not applying it properly. Mm -hmm. Interesting little side note, you notice that if there's a 5% variance between the polls before the election day and the election day, then that's cause for crisis. Well, Bernie Sanders polls, his results jumped 20% in Michigan, in the Michigan primary. And these people who were doing all these exit polls, you know, nobody was saying, well, did he cheat there? I don't know. 
I know it can cheat. All I have to do is think about my favorite little embezzler, and I said, no, we have a problem, so I'm going to work on it, whether or not a specific election was stolen because we have evidence from exit polls. I'm not going to comment on because I, I just don't have that expertise, but I know that um, you have to apply the statistics properly, and I've seen cases where that's not done right. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the way they used to do exit polls, they would only call people with landlines, and the younger people who are so were so strongly for Bernie do not have landlines. They all have cell phones, so they didn't wouldn't even have included them in the exit polling. So there's a lot of variances that you need to look at. But I do know that if the United States has targeted some country for whatever you want to call it, regime change, uh, or there are a lot of other less kind words, uh, if there's an election where the people they want out of office have won by a variance of more than 2% from the exit polls, uh, the, our government is screaming about that, saying that the election was, was fraudulent. And so many of the elections in this country are way off from the exit polls. In fact, the way the exit pollers, uh, exit polls used to be extremely accurate in this country before we got electronic voting machines. And once we got electronic voting machines, all of a sudden the exit polls went wacky. And so much so that the Republicans wanted to eliminate exit polls. And the only way the exit polls, pollsters were able to keep their jobs was to change the numbers in the exit polls to agree with the election numbers. Uh, they would uh, they used some strange words like likely voters for Democrats uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to explain why uh, they were changing the numbers. But it's, uh, you know, so for some reason, uh, the borders made exit polls work different inside the country as opposed to outside the country. It's, uh, I don't believe it. Richard Hayes Phillips, I think, as mentioned earlier this evening, uh, being the person who wrote a book called Witness to a Crime about the Ohio 2004 election, right. did publish an article in blackbox40.org recently about what is an audit and what are exit polls. And he's basically said the only way we have proof that an election was stolen is if we go back and count the ballots. So that was his opinion. Uh, I think the exit polls can be an indication that smoke, that there's something funny going on. Uh, proof, not so much. And folks, with that answer, we take it back full circle to hand counting the ballots. Absolutely. All right. We want to thank you all for um, yes, tuning in. Okay, one more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you want. Uh, one very good book on exit polls is uh, Jonathan Simon's book, uh, Code Red, uh, <laughs> meaning that the uh, uh, that the that the election results uh, shift to the right or to the Republicans toward red Republican as opposed to blue Democrat. The, the, the shift. It's it's a very good book. Okay, thanks so much for that offering. Okay? A question from the All audience. Right. Um, how do you suggest we could organize um, to push for hand-counted ballots? Okay. Jim, you want to take that? You have to organize locally. I think the best way to do it again is to get the counties to do some experiments with it in small elections. So you go down to your county supervisors, your county registrar, and say, we'd like you to do hand counting. Here's some material, again, Google hand counted paper ballots, uh, about how to do it. And go look at how other countries do it. Uh, in Germany, they sit eight to a table when they were hand counting these open mail ballots. So 
They had 10,000 people just for the vote by mail in Cologne. Uh, when you're trying to spread an idea, you start small where you have some kind of advantage, political advantage, you get mainly in this case, you're going to have a registrar who is going to be sympathetic and is willing to try the experiment. They try it there, then they expand it, and you get it to the neighboring county and so on. The other, in California, as I said, we're not going to get it. I would like to see it should be obvious to everybody we need proportional mm -hmm. representation in Sacramento. So you have lots of smaller parties having representation. That's going to be really hard to get. I, what I'm working on, we're trying to work on what we can get done. Mm -hmm. In this case, the move is away from precincts, away from being the possibility of counting ballots in the precinct. So the other part, place you can count the ballots by hand is in the audits, the 1% manual tally. We need to expand that so that they hand count more of those ballots. We need a very good chain of custody, and we need to audit the chain of custody so that, yeah, we had 372 ballots come out of XYZ precinct, and 372 were delivered sealed at county headquarters, and you follow, you track those batches of ballots. That's part of an audit. And then you open a significant number of them, much more than 1%, and then count them to double check the machines. I like redundancy. I want machines checking the hand count, and I want hand counts checking machines. So I want both ways. And then I start to get some confidence in it. In California, when. All right, folks, you've offered some great questions tonight. And I think Jim and Richard have offered us some great uh, answers, guys. Thank you so much. Um, if you are anything like we are from Ballots for Bernie, you are eager to learn as much as you can about the um, elections process here in the state of California and what you can do to help. Again, we need an army of poll workers to volunteer um, to work in the election this fall. Please, if you have not done so already, reach out and contact your local registrar of voters and find out how you can become a poll worker and get trained. Do we have any more questions from the room? All right. So folks, we'll be back with you next week, live streaming some more great questions, great answers. Um, and let us know what your questions are. Um, you can use this live stream um, uh, comment thread um, to um, discuss amongst yourselves and to also shoot questions out to ballots for Bernie. Um, and you never know, your question might be our topic for next week's live stream. Again, thanks so much. This is Lucy Riley with Ballots for Bernie tuning out for this week.